Thanks, Christina. Are you okay, Glenn? Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. You should be able to share your slides now. Okay, dogs. And the recording started as well. Great. There we go. All yours, Glenn. Okay, uh, so hello everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, my name is Glenn Campy. Uh, with me, who you just saw uh, on the screen is Terry Cholton. Uh, we both work for Newcastle University. Um, so I'll say at the top that neither of us are engineers. Um, we're both um, essentially learning technologists, um, but that may have some differences to how it's understood elsewhere. Uh, obviously, it's quite a broad title anyway. Um, but because our team name is quite long and unwieldy, we're technically learning enhancement and technology project advisors um, because we work in the learning enhancement technology products team, um, which is part of a central or cross faculty service called learning and teaching development services. And our team's role um, is usually to work with a school or a program team to um, help enhance learning and teaching, um, often but not always with the use uh, of digital tools. During the pandemic, uh, our team worked uh, really on just one project, which was essentially helping everyone to deliver teaching remotely. Um, but we're this year just getting back to what our team was intended to do. So I'm working with the School of Modern Languages on something new and Terry's working with the School of Computing at the moment, um, doing something I understand very little about. Um, but before the pandemic, uh, and for the earlier parts of it, we both worked with the School of Engineering here at Newcastle. Um, Terry for longer than me, he was in post for sort of 10 or 11 months, I think. Um, before I moved to Newcastle last February and joined the project uh, when it was already in full swing. Um, so before we look um, specifically at, at the labs, uh, which is uh, the main focus of this webinar, um, Terry's just going to sort of set the scene, uh, but give us some context about what this uh, this project was. That's great. Thanks very much, Glenn. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> I'll leave Glenn to keep an eye on the chat for me, if that's all right, Glenn. Just in case there's any questions, just feel free to pop them in there as we go. That would be great. Um, so yes, let's see if we can move this slide on. Excellent. So the School of Engineering's flexible stage one. I've noticed Martin Edney, who was also part of the sort of wider project has appeared in the chat. Hello, Martin, nice to see you. Um, so before I go into detail on the blended labs themselves, I thought I'd just take two minutes to kind of quickly set the scene, as Glenn said, uh, and touch on the rationale and the context behind our work. Uh, why it was we were redesigning our labs on such a large scale. Um, as the name suggests, the Engineering Flexible Stage 1 is a common Stage 1 engineering program designed to give every first year engineering student a broad introduction to the subject. So whether that be civil engineering students, mechanical engineering students, electrical, marine, they all do the same first year and in doing so get a flavour for all disciplines before needing to commit to one of those disciplines at stage two and beyond. Uh, this gives students the flexibility to uh, and time to explore the many different specialisms available to them, different career paths available as an engineer before needing to commit to any one of them for the remainder of their degree and possibly for the rest of their life. <laughs> so it was a pretty big project. And as we will show you today, Glenn and I, who, as Glenn said, are essentially cross-faculty learning designers and tele-advisors, we were kindly in, uh, invited to join the engineering team. And why were we invited? Well, development of this new program required a complete curriculum redesign, as well as a shift towards collaborative module design and team teaching. Uh, project leaders also wanted to modernize their taught content and lab experiences and make better use of digital technologies in their delivery. First, this was to build upon the, student, uh, the university's strategic commitment to uh, provide an educational experience supported and enhanced by technology. But more than that, it was also to try and demonstrate digital innovation and position the school as a forward-looking, ambitious leader in engineering education. And that's where Glenn and I come in. So we came and we added to the discipline-specific subject knowledge and the pedagogic knowledge that was already present in the engineering team with a deeper technical knowledge. So knowledge of university systems, effective digital practice and content development know-how. Um, and this partnership model helped create a sustainable culture of working together where each member of the design team was kind of valued for what they were able to bring to the project. Hey, and where the real value from that relationship happened at the intersection points you know, where the technology, the pedagogy and the subject knowledge all came together. 
do like a nice uh, PowerPoint animation. After that, we ran a number of learning design workshops at the outset of the project to try and work out exactly how we were going to achieve. Uh, actually, I, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. We started off with the, uh, a number of vision workshops um, with the engineering staff to get all stakeholders in a room together and then collectively trying to determine what it was that everybody wanted to get out of this project. Um, and then after that, we ran a number of learning design workshops to try and work out exactly how we were going to achieve that vision and how we could help establish an infrastructure in the school to help support staff in the development of their new modules and their new labs. And moreover, how a blended approach could be used to improve the student learning experience and combine the best of face-to-face -face teaching and lab activities with the best of online learning. Um, now, I should say, aside from the pedagogic advantages of a blended approach, shown on the screen here. Um, things like flexibility, interactivity, availability, accessibility, reusability, all the, all the illities. There was also some unavoidable practical reasons why we were doing what we were doing. Uh, by combining all of the discipline specific programs into one common program, student numbers were expected to increase substantially. Uh, we were projecting 400 or so for the first run of the new program with higher numbers going forward. And that's pretty much what we've got. I think it was just shy of 400 last year with 450 or so this year, so big numbers. And as you can imagine, everyone was very much aware from the outset that this would place a large strain on not only teaching capacity, but also estates and lab space, not to mention the costs associated with those labs, materials, staffing and such. And so a blended approach and its, <laughs> its promise to Streamline delivery and reduce teaching overheads presented a very attractive proposition. Uh, just for completeness, uh, before I move on, I should say that a blended program, as you probably very well know, uh, in the pre-pandemic sense of the term, generally requires something between 20 and 80% of content to be delivered online using resources created specifically for that purpose. Um, amounts vary in that definition, but a 20% minimum was what we were working towards at Newcastle. And I'll pass you over to Glenn. Yeah, so we fast forward to October 2020, so just over a year ago now, um, the School of Engineering launches this new Flexible Stage 1 programme. Um, and while the, the project was still uh, sort of in pre-pandemic times, there was a hope um, of, of a sort of a vague aim that about 30% online was sort of an imagined um, number. Uh, and that was already seen as quite a challenge. It meant a lot of change for the school who'd become very accustomed to doing things in person. Um, but as it turned out, we ended up delivering 100% of it online, um, as I'm sure like everyone in the webinar will remember that spring and summer last year um, where, where that adjustment was made um, because obviously the pandemic hit um, and everything changed. Um, but as the work we've done so far in moving some of this delivery online um, was already in place, it had put us in quite a good position to pull that off. And we were able to sort of get out of the block straight away uh, and start reimagining how those in-person elements could, could move online uh, to join the rest of the program. And a key feature of the online delivery that we already had uh, was the work that we've been doing on the digital labs. Thanks, Glenn. Yeah. So yes, although we took a holistic approach to blending all aspects of the programme's taught delivery, for the rest of this session, we're really just going to focus on how we help to uh, blend and embed more digital learning opportunities into our first year engineering labs. Starting with um, our digital lab guides. Right, let me test my streaming capabilities here. Don't worry if this video is a bit jumpy on your end. It's just yet to illustrate the lab. Um, this was a video recording we made to demonstrate our while uh, our work a little bit back. Um, I'm not going to share the sound. I want to turn that off um, because it will just drown me out. And my colleague presents this video, but the sound's off. So just pretend she's not there. So what are digital lab guides? Well, we created these in Canvas, Canvas being our VLE, to blend the labs and flip specific aspects of the experience. The idea was to try and extend our traditional lab activities beyond the confines of the physical timetable sessions. Firstly, this was to allow students to get a feel for a lab beforehand, before they arrived on site in person. 
uh, just sort of felt a little less overwhelmed by being in the lab itself. Uh, this is engineering, you know, so our labs tend to be quite cavernous spaces full of heavy machinery that could be quite daunting for new students. Um, and also pre-work was used to complete any lab introductions or lab orientations, including any important health and safety checks that needed to do. So for some labs, we had videos they needed to watch um, and forms they needed to complete and agree to before attending the lab in person. Um, and then when they did arrive, they could jump straight in, follow instructions and collect data on their devices um, and really get the best out of their time in the lab. And that's what was really driving a lot of what we did here, trying to get the best out of uh, valuable lab time. Afterwards, after the lab, students could go off and finish the experience by completing post lab work. Uh, and that was often things like writing reflective lab reports or completing knowledge checks, that kind of thing. Um, automated assessments were also built into these digital labs, which meant students got marks for the assessed part of the lab instantly, which was, it was good for them, but more so it was good for us because it meant academic staff and demonstrators didn't have to mark 400 weekly lab reports manually. <laughs> I think we've all been there. It's something we were trying to avoid. Um, I should say students in engineering were all issued with tablet computers to do this work, but those tablets were by no means required. Um, if they forgot them or anything, uh, they could just use their mobile phones. They could use a, lab, a laptop computer. Um, they could even just take notes on paper and enter the results later after the lab. Our approach and technology choices were always designed to enhance and increase opportunity, never to reduce it. So nobody was ever at a disadvantage. Now, this is the approach we are taking this year and we would have took this approach last year had it not been for the pandemic. Uh, but because of our blended approach, when we went into lockdown, we were able to pivot really quickly and shift our engineering labs to full online delivery. All we needed to do was just swap out the on-site bit, uh, the experimental elements, uh, and replace them with something like a recording or sometimes a third-party simulation, which were were able to buy in. Um, and once or twice as well, we sent them home experiments, which they could do, which they could do at home. And now this year, all we've done is swap them back again for the real labs. So they do a little bit of work before the lab, come to the lab, do the experiments, go away and do the post lab work. But the online versions from last year are still available for students who missed the lab in person this year. So it's all good. All this material is getting, it's getting used. Over to you, Glenn. Yeah, so just going to look at a few uh, examples of, of um, how these labs worked uh, online. So this lab um, called Product Disassembly um, presented three activities to students who needed to complete two of the three. And this was initially, um, and again this year, uh, is an open choice of two from dissembling a pneumatic ram or, or a motor or using uh, these things called molar models um, to explore, uh, the, or they explore how to, to reinforce structures. Um, and with this switch to remote labs, a molar activity became uh, a compulsory one with a series of images and videos showing how these structures with differing reinforcements reacted to pressure uh, and some associated questions that use those same videos uh, to demonstrate how structures held up to pressure. Um, there was also a choice uh, between the motor and pneumatic ram, uh, one of which was included in a kit that was posted out to students at home so they could complete the, uh, the disassembly remotely. Um, this was just a package that sent out to each one so that they could uh, complete the practical part of the lab uh, at home, it included all the tools they'd need, plus either a, a motor or a bicycle pump, which um, acting as a, a pneumatic ram uses the same technology. Um, so these were all built into a single canvas module uh, with the molar activity available for everyone. And we made use of the mastery pass feature in Canvas to open up uh, the appropriate disassembly activity for each student. Um, depending on what they had in the kit, it would either be the RAM or the motor. Um, and the structure of this lab, um, you can see the sort of before, during and after parts uh, scrolling around on the screen. Uh, that's common for most of the labs on the program where it's sort of clearly laid out with that before, during, after pattern. Um, and the idea pre-pandemic was students would do everything they need to do to prepare for the lab at, at home, uh, like Terry's already mentioned, and it, yeah, including health and safety stuff, things like that, uh, and then come to the lab already prepared, understanding what was going to happen to complete the activity. Uh, and that part of the Canvas module had everything they need for that. And then afterwards, they could do, do some knowledge check questions, would often be the case. Uh, but also, there's a prompt to write a reflection in their digital logbook, which we'll come to, uh, and also digital badges, uh, which we'll also come to as well. Um, and now Terry's going to tell us about Concrete. <laughs> That's 
right, concrete. Um, now, in a, in a couple of instances, uh, we went a little further and we augmented our labs with uh, additional custom built simulations. Um, one of which was our virtual concrete mixing lab, which is a lot more exciting than it sounds. I will just press play on that. Um, now, this was developed from the ground up by, by us and the Learning and Teaching Development Service at Newcastle and pretty much worked the same as a blended lab. Um, the one difference being it allowed students to try out different concrete mixes, different designs without the costs and overheads of doing it in real life. Um, and those costs were not unsubstantial. Um, and it was also the problem of how to get rid of all the concrete mixes afterwards, you know, which we had done. So there's lots of, sort of practical reasons why we took this approach. So the idea was students would go to the labs in person and experience concrete mixing, but then afterwards they would go off and experiment with different mixes virtually, which they would calculate themselves. They would see videos of uh, specific mixes being created, as you can see on the screen here. Um, then they'd go through the whole curing process and then eventually the testing process, which would normally take months in real life, but with this app took no time at all. It was instant. Um, here's the testing process happening now. This was always the best bit. This involved hey, this involved putting the concrete samples under huge pressure loads um, and then watching them explode. <laughs> Personally, it was the highlight of the, the whole project for me, recording the 30 odd eventualities that we had to capture to make this, this uh, app work. It was really good. Um, and importantly, students could do all of this testing instantly without having to wait the months to see the results as, as they did with the one single sample that they did actually make. Um, so yeah, it was, it was really good for that. Um, and what's important with this was it allowed students to make bad concrete, um, which as it turns out is just as important as knowing how to make good concrete, but allowed them to experiment and fail in a safe environment. Um, personally, I always assumed when it came to concrete, the harder the better, but no, turns out that uh, too hard is too unforgiving apparently. Um, and if it fails, it tends to fail with a bang rather than showing signs of fatigue, you know, so yeah, fatigue being signs you can spot so you can get out the building before the, the, the roof falls on your head. So yeah, really interesting and a really nice little, little app. Uh, students really liked it. And the staff there uh, use this app to summatively assess the students too, you know, which always helps uh, drive interest in it, you know, so every student got to experience this to some degree. Um, and there's also been interest from other institutions as well uh, to try and take this forward. So as Glenn mentioned at the start, we've now left engineering technically, uh, but we've left them with all these tools and they are developing them themselves going forward, which was great. Um, what have we got next? Glenn, it's another one of yours. Yeah, so this is um, yeah another example using uh, an app. Um, this lab uh, is for a module called Electric and Magnetic Systems, uh, and it required some sort of specialist heavy equipment that was on site and wouldn't be available to students completing the lab remotely. Um, after consi some consideration, um, which included sort of scaling down the lab for a home kit, um, testing for which kept stripping the fuses in one uh, lecturer's home, I remember. Um, so they bin that off. Uh, but the, the team decided to use a simulator to conduct the lab, uh, which allowed the students to sort of build the same circuit digitally. Um, and there's a desktop version of this software called Multisim, um, which is on a lot of the computers on campus, but uh, it was found that it didn't run very well on the remote desktop software. Um, so I decided to just use this sort of browser-based version of it instead, um, where the students would be able to complete everything they needed to do for the lab for, for free, so they wouldn't need to subscribe to it. Um, this lab also made use of an online tool called Numbers, uh, which is this one we can see here. Um, this was developed at Newcastle by uh, the School of Maths, Stats and Physics. And it sees a lot of use in engineering programs, so the, the students were already quite familiar with it uh, and would become quite familiar with it through the year. Um, and this contained all the instructions they needed uh, to, to build their circuits, notes on what screenshots to take for, as part of their submission, uh, and a voltage calculation uh, at the end here, um, which is based on the circuit that they've built um, and then automatically marked within numbers. There's then this template document for them to insert their screenshots uh, and a place to then upload it as a, as a submission for that lab. And it's just um, a, an example of, uh, they had to, to do quite a lot of thinking around quarters to get that one uh, delivered remotely, but, um, yeah, what wouldn't have been possible to, to do otherwise, they, they were able to just use that online tool to uh, to still meet the learning objectives, which was the essential thing in the end. 
Yeah, great. Cheers, Glenn. Right. So that was the blended lab guides. Um, now, running alongside that, complementing all of those, was something called the digital logbook. Um, now, this was built in OneNote using a VLE integration called uh, OneNote Class Notebooks. <laughs> and what that is, is essentially it's just an interface that allows you to automatically provision a OneNote notebook to every student instantly via the VLE. Um, now, what this was for was it was designed to replace traditional bound logbooks, so physical logbooks um, that students used their that used to be issued with. Uh, so engineers normally use logbooks to take notes of work on site. Uh, it's a professional and often legal requirement. Uh, so they use it to scribble down thoughts, reflections, diagrams, lab results, meeting minutes, you know, you name it. Um, and this represents a formal journal of their work and decision-making process as they go. Um, and now the digital logbook, that offered them a way to do this, well, uh, digitally <laughs> using their tablet. On the surface, I think students thought we did this just to make use of the tablets, but really behind the scenes, we took this approach as it had many benefits over the physical logbooks. Um, it was accessible, it was always backed up, it couldn't get wet and turn to mush on site, um, and it couldn't be lost or eaten by the dog or anything. Um, it was also tightly integrated with the blended, uh, blended lab guides that we just showed you before there. Um, so it was very easy for staff to access who were marking the logbooks. And that was one of the critical parts of this, that uh, staff could just access every single student's logbook automatically, very easily through the, uh, the VLE, through Canvas, uh, because they were marking this summatively. Um, and of course, because of the pandemic, we had an instant solution here to the problem of physical logbooks. So had we have given every student a physical book, we would have been in big trouble when it came to the pandemic. But fortunately, we had set this up on, on OneNote um, and it worked, it worked lovely. Um, yes, we'd never been able to issue and mark the physical logbook. So this was a, this was a definite advantage. It is just one note at the end of the day since, but it worked really well on the tablet, especially when students are, are taking notes in labs. Works great for that. And here you can see some of the notes that were being written by a student. I've just pulled some out at random. Um, this was on the stresses and strains of a trust frame, I believe. <laughs> As Glenn said, we're, we're not engineers, uh, but we, tr we tried our best. Uh, and these notes, like I said, were taken in lab with the calculations entered into the blended lab, uh, lab guide afterwards. Uh, using numbers. Uh, so yeah, I think that worked worked really well. Um, now, digital stickers, yeah, so this is a bit of fun, really. Um, we, we created these to try and encourage students to interact with the labs a little bit more. Um, so in the past, there were certain sort of problems with students not coming to them, not, not seeing the value. Um, so what we did is we created these, which are a this is a small subset of a, a larger collection of digital stickers. We didn't call them digital badges because I didn't want it to clash with the kind of well-known digital badges. Uh, these were just sort of little images that they could, um, that they got awarded for participating in and completion of the labs. The idea was to just to try and encourage a little bit more engagement. Um, I haven't totally uh, sort of evaluated their success or anything, but at the end of last year, it was great to see students hurriedly running around trying to collect these, you know, and swapping them like panini stickers <laughs> and being annoyed when they were missing some and asking if we'd run labs again so that they could collect them, you know. So it was designed as a bit of fun, as I say, based on an idea I had from watching my nephew playing games and collecting Xbox achievements. Um, but it certainly did seem to help whip up interest in the labs. Um, so yeah, it's on my list to try and give this a little bit more thought and try and explore them all a little bit more formally. But uh, yeah, it was a nice little thing. So you complete a lab, uh, the, the digital part, the post work part, and afterwards you would get one of these badges and all they needed to do was just copy them and then paste them um, into your uh, digital logbook. Um, so yeah, nice and simple, nothing really complicated, but worked really well. Right, so last but not least, um, as part of all of this work with the labs, we also develop a lot of new digital content for the blended parts of the labs, the online parts. 
these included simple PowerPoint stacks, but really went all the way through to very high quality videos and interactive quiz content. Um, we always tried to get colleagues to do this themselves wherever possible and supported them in their endeavors. But wherever something a little bit more special, um, a little bit more bling, as we tend to call it, uh, was required, we were there and happy to help. Um, I'll show you a couple of examples. See if these play. Uh, yes, so this is a video describing how metal bends under load, I believe. <laughs> Again, this was used for pre work as part of a blend, blended lab on experimental loads. Uh, yeah, it looks quite nice. This is uh, one of my colleagues bending a ruler. Um, <laughs> it looks really nice. You know, I, th I, th I think uh, the, the, the quality of the content we made for the, uh, this project was was really, really good, really awesome. Um, so yeah, that, that goes on like this for a couple of minutes. So we made quite a lot of videos like this one. Uh, it's great watching all of the stuff flex. And these are things that students would take from this and then go into the lab and then experimentally kind of try and then come back and uh, reflect in the digital logbook and write up the notes. So it looks, looks really nice. Um, move on. Here is another one. What's this one going to be? It is the Corno cycle. Yes. So this is an engine cycle video. I'll just fast forward this to something a little bit more exciting. So yeah, this is like how an engine works, like a car engine. So it's simple things like fuel intake, combustion, exhaust, that kind of thing. Um, so this was used in course material too, but was intended to be used before an engine uh, disassembly lab. So students would kind of see how the engine worked and then they'd go to the lab and they'd, they'd tear an engine apart and see how it kind of worked and how all these sort of bits happened. And it was all a little bit beyond me, but. Yeah, and the, the students really kind of reacted very well to all this content. I, I, I thought we put into getting them to look nice, really worked. Um, we used lots of different systems to do this. This was created in um, the Adobe software suite. So it's a slightly more complex uh, level of, sort of content creation than you can normally create in things like Camtasia. But uh, Camtasia, I'll get you about 99% of the way there. This was just the same as that, but with just that little sprinkling of extra extra jazz on top a little bit of extra bling you know, what have we got next so yeah that was the content so i mean oh, we made a lot of videos like that uh, some not quite as complex but i think we made over 50 of them at the last count so a lot of effort went into making them uh, and if, if i was to say that we got a little bit uh, <sighs> stressed out maybe towards the end as we had all these videos to create and were taking so much longer than we thought that would do. So if we if we can learn a lesson going forward, it's that video content takes a, a lot more time than you think it's going to take. Um, so here's a few lines of feedback from our, um, our first year students, um, pretty much on track. I think the plan was to do 30 minutes of talking in this presentation. Um, yeah, so what we did is towards the end of last year, we did a, a a review with the students. We've got them all online in a room together on Zoom uh, with the academic staff. And we just asked them about how the how the module went, what they thought of the the digital content we were creating, the digital blended labs, and also all the talk content that we're getting. Um, and I would say 100% of the feedback, to little anecdotal at this stage, was uh, entirely good. You know, it was really, really, uh, really promising. Um, the, engineering team are doing more thorough analytics and assessment this year because it, it's sort of running as as intended. Uh, last year's fully online approach was largely kind of seen as a one-off. Um, but yeah, we're a bit early for meaningful stats at the minute, but I would say so far so good. Students really did like them, especially the, the digital labs. The idea that they could do a little bit before they turned up. So when they arrived at the lab, they kind of had a bit of an idea what was going off. Um, so yeah. Really good. It was a good year. Like I said, got a little bit stressful towards the end creating all these online videos, but hey ho. And that's kind of it, really. So, uh, yeah. Any last reflections from the project, Glenn? Yeah. So I think we've we've mentioned that one or twice, once or twice already. But by being at that starting point of having blended delivery um, already planned before the pandemic hit. Um, with loads of online activities, heavy use of the BLE, um, like this particular program is in a much better position to pivot 
quickly to remote learning than colleagues elsewhere in the school was and that is a, a, a much bigger struggle for people in sort of the later years because this was just the first year of, of uh, the course which is now being taught through to be the main program um, but aside from that the pandemic really had a big impact on how this program was delivered and and how it continues to be delivered this year as well um, like I allude, alluded earlier to some initial reluctance from the school to embrace blended learning uh, sort of the concepts but they because they like highly value in-person lectures uh, see these as a key part of their programs which is like very understandable um, but one of the key practical reasons for delivering this pro program blended was the space considerations for, for lectures and instead of converting those lectures to online learning activities there were plans across the program to sort of timetable the same lecture two or three times in a week uh, depending on available space and, and I still remember sort of um, we were quite a way into the point where it was going to be apparent we'd have to deliver 100% online um, like I still remember a comment in a team's discussion by one lecturer that said oh this is great I'm only going to have to deliver this lecture once um, so that's like came to recognize the benefits of blended learning um, and that's sort of reflected in the way that the program continues to be delivered this year uh, and even things like um, where we were in supposed to be supposed to be the, the intention that was we'd help them create videos and online content and things they sort of still saw that a bit as our job um but once that they came to to having to make videos themselves we were able to make the step to say look this is how we made this you can do this really simply with powerpoint and, and like our uh, in-house version of panopto um and and just do it and they all did it and they all learned how to do that uh and yeah and and take that on as like a legacy skill from uh, from the pandemic um yeah and there's there was a reflection that terry had that was specific to labs as well which i think um we thought would be a good thing to end on um come back for that yeah um just talking to glenn before this, this presentation i was i was thinking about what it was like when we first started this project and i went along to one of the uh, labs the physical labs now this is well before the, the pandemic hit and i was watching how the lab ran so it was a another concrete lab and students turned up they all stood there they didn't really have a clue why they were there what was going off they watched some things happen in front of them um, and they were taking notes as they went and then afterwards uh, i was watching them and they were, the notes they were taking often were wrong because they weren't quite sure what they should be doing um, anyway they did this they saw something happen in front of them and then they left and that was essentially the end of it um, and i thought to myself what a missed opportunity what a shame you know and that's kind of what fed a lot into this sort of blended approach where we would try and orient orientate the students that's the right word to the lab before they arrived so that when they got there they knew exactly what was happening and they didn't have to get the grips with being in the lab the orientation in the lab uh, being told where all the materials were having to sit through um, another health and safety uh, presentation that they could get cracking straight away the second they turned up um, and get the most out of that one hour of lab uh, that valuable lab time that they had um, and then afterwards go away and have a think about what happened um, reflect in the digital logbook that we created about what what you saw um, and also use some of the knowledge checks that we created to, to really help reinforce what it was that just happened <laughs> um, and i think now looking at these labs running kind of properly this year for the first year and seeing how better students come prepared to the labs and then leave having spent a good hour on it and then go off and do the the reflective practice afterwards i think is excellent you know i think it was definitely worth the effort worth the time um and yeah and i think we've i would say it, parts of the project were a little tricky um but i believe that glenn and i we have left the project with a lot of new friends and what has proven to be a, an enduring professional relationship with the school ever since um so yeah it was looking back it was a pleasure um as it was to talk to you about it today so yeah so thank you very much uh, for taking the time to listen to us i think i've just went over 30 minutes but never mind and i'm happy to answer any questions as is glenn um, i've not been able to keep an eye on the chat because I've, I've never used blackboard collaborate before so i'm not entirely sure how this thing's working but i've heard some ping pongs as we've been going so is anything in the, the chat there glenn i'll stop sharing that um i've had a couple of things so um someone was asking about the concrete lap, uh, app um and it, it has sort of been answered that yeah that was developed in-house um yeah. but just I, just in case there's any any more information about that um i don't know if there's anything that someone wanted the, the to know con the concrete up yeah so uh, 
yeah, that was developed completely in house. It didn't use any tools. So I come from a programming background, really. I'm a, a, a computer scientist by trade. So I have a lot of programming knowledge. So we, when I came on the, the project, um, we identified that as one of those things where it would, having a little bit of something extra would really benefit the project. Um, I would never have normally used it. I would never create a, a program, <laughs> which is essentially what it was. That would have to be maintained by people who didn't really know how to do it. Uh, so what we did was, because the, the team I was working with in engineering already had a, a background in, in programming, I thought that they could take this forward. They could maintain it. Uh, so what we did is we created that from the ground up using uh, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Really easy. Um, and all it does, technic technically behind the scenes, it just brings together a lot of different videos and creates a bit of a, like one of those old fashioned choose your own adventure books. You know, so at each stage you make a decision and then it branches and you make a decision and then it branches, branches. I think at the end we had something like 64 different eventualities, but a lot of the videos, you cannot really tell the difference between one mix or the other, you know, so we're, we're able to cut corners um, a little bit, but it's a great way for students to, to get to experience that. If you don't have that programming capacity or development capacity in your departments yourselves, there's probably a million different ways you could do that. You know, you could have just done it using something like H5P, it's a program we use here, or you could do it just using branching scenarios within your VLE, I'm sure. Um, yeah, at the end of the day, it was just a, like I said, it's a choose your own adventure, a tree structure. Um, if you're good at uh, PowerPoint, you could even just do it with uh, action buttons, I'm sure. So you could lead students through different slides depending on what decisions to take. Um, yeah, worked well. <laughs> <laughs> um... There's another one here about um, some of your digital resources and activities are supposed to be completed before the labs and did student or students always complete them? Or were they incentivized? I think there were some labs, especially ones with health and safety considerations, like where they were going to be let loose on power tools and things where um, they yeah. weren't allowed to start yeah. the lab until they'd done it. Um, but I don't know about all of them for, for sure. I think they would probably have had to go and do all those things at the beginning of the lab and lose out on some time, which was probably Probably more stick than carrot, but that would be the, uh, the incentive <laughs> right. to, uh, to, yeah, to complete them first. It is, um, yes. As with all these things, there were, there were lots of students who didn't do all the labs. Um, but what we did find was that the, real, the second they realised that these uh, digital stickers were, were on the go, it certainly seemed to drive a lot more interest, uh, especially towards the end when they realised we were missing some. Uh, because these labs were online, we were able to run them essentially any time we wanted. Um, so it was it was a lot easier for them to go back and try them again and get the get the badges. But yeah, yeah. Unless it was um, unless there was a mark attached to it, you know what it's like. Students are very strategic in the way they approach these things. If there was no mark, there was, no, there was nothing to be kind of gained from it in terms of um, assessment. Not everybody come. Not everybody partake. Partook. But uh, yeah, I think with them being online as well and. Them not having to be somewhere physically, that certainly seem to seem to help. But, yeah. Um, what about making videos with specific programs using? So that was, um, I think, most of those ones that looked the nicest were made in uh, in Adobe Creative Cloud. So it'd be a mixture of Premiere, Illustrator, and uh, After Effects. Wasn't it? Um, That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that was Ash, a colleague of ours, who made those two that we saw. That's right. Um, so yeah, I would say that almost all those videos you could create are a lot easier just using PowerPoint. I mean, that would that would get you about 90% of the way there towards a really fancy looking video. Um, it's And that's completely within your control as to how nice you make that. Um, yeah, it, it's a, there's a learning uh, curve and quite a development overhead in terms of making videos of that quality all the time. Uh, but what, I think we took approach of almost headlining certain um, modules in, in labs. So we'd have a really nice video, something that really kind of hit the students. And I thought, wow. But then below that, there was kind of lower entry stuff, you know, so like PowerPoint presentations and things. But we, we had them at that stage. They were, they were already bought in. Yeah. I think I always took the, the kind of approach of using trailers, like film trailers, where the, you would try and blow them away with a lot of uh, fancy <laughs> graphics and not gratuitously so but just just trying to make them look as best as we could and what we had that ability in-house um, but afterwards yeah the, 
We also found out we used a lot of templates as well. So we would create a, a very basic template. Um, and that our academic colleagues would, would leap on them and then would create things like just simple presentations or simple videos using those templates and instantly it was so much better because they kind of fit in the whole. Um, so yeah, I, th I think there's, there's something to be said for templating without a doubt. It's something we're trying to use more and more uh, across the university and the projects we're, we're doing at the minute. But um, yeah, Adobe Creative Cloud has certainly got its, uh, it's got its place, but I don't think I'd recommend it to uh, people other than folk like ourselves who are content developers, by and large. It just takes so much time. Um, there's another one. I don't know if there's been much feedback about this, but about um, do you think students still lose something from not having the physical experience of working with materials, mixing, doing the test themselves? I think that was specifically about concrete too. Yeah, um, oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, I would never in a million years uh, prioritize doing this stuff digitally and virtually over the physical labs. Um, when it came to the concrete one, the, the difference there was students could only ever do one thing at a time because it was so busy and the material costs were so high. And like I said, once they've created this huge concrete slab, it was really hard to get rid of it as well. Um, so the approach we took was that students would do one of them. Uh, so they would mix the concrete, they would see what happens, they would cure it over time, they would come back weeks later, say it's cured, um, and then come back a couple of more weeks later and test it. Uh, so to get that experience, the hands-on experience, uh, but would never be able to explore different avenues. Um, and students, as, as we would, they didn't want to fail at that. So they would make the best concrete mix they could. But like I said earlier, that wasn't always a good thing. Um, it was good to be able to explore creating bad concrete and to see the effect of it. Um, like I said, not not all bad concrete was actually worse than what you thought. So creating concrete that was a, had a bit of give seemed on the surface to be a bad thing, and students wouldn't do it. But as it turned out, it was actually a good thing because it provided a bit more flexibility in the concrete mix. So yeah, I personally learned a lot about concrete um, <laughs> in the last in the last year or so. It's really good. good. Is that the only learning when it replaces them? Yeah, yeah, I've seen Martin Eddie's comment there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, this was a um, originally when we designed this whole project, it the pandemic was not on the cards. You know, we were expecting to run it last year, like we did this year. Uh, and students very much wanted the face to face experience as they wanted the hands on experience in the labs. And at no point we wanted to replace that really. Um, but then when the pandemic hit and we were forced to do this stuff online, uh, we found out we're already so far ahead of the game almost and we were able as a glance at the pivot this stuff um so it still provided a, a really good experience for the students last year but uh, i would never replace those face-to-face -face sessions and i would never uh, replace the kind of hands-on experiences in the lab in particular that's 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 the big thing um because that's where the value is i think especially in programs like engineering it's about getting your hands dirty, you know, it's about getting your, getting your wellies on, getting out onto the site, seeing how this stuff works. Uh, I'd imagine as, a, as an engineer, that's why you go into engineering, um, certainly civil engineering. Same reason you would go into electrical engineering is chances are you probably want to make, I don't know, a ham radio or a, um, a remote control car, the sort of projects they do there. Um, so being able to physically do that, that's, that's the important thing. And we were hoping that these labs would just enhance that um, and make those experiences just that little bit better so that they've got the um, there's a lot of students and there's there's not that much lab capacity so when they do go in the lab we wanted them to use that time from the second they got there the second they left uh, wisely you know make the best uses they could but, uh, yeah so like i said i think this that everything we did here was to enhance the talk content rather than uh, replace it Anything else there, Glenn? There's one, one more about uh, about badges. Um, how have the badges been with students? Often seems like they get them at the start and then don't bother afterwards. So were they compulsory? <laughs> uh, yes, yeah. So at, at the end of every lab, I think there was was there about ten or so labs, Glenn? I can't remember now. I think it was about ten. It's, 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 it's yeah. It's, it's been a pretty much a sort of a year since we did this now, so it's not it's not completely in, sort of fresh in my mind. But at the end of, of every lab, they would, they would do the physical lab bit, and then they would go away and they would do some sort of knowledge check or reflective report or something. And the second they did that, um, 
they would be given the badge. It was almost like on the VLE, you would have to complete a quiz, say, and then the page afterwards, the completion page, they would get this little badge and then they would copy and paste it into the books. Um, I mean, I was very much aware of students gaming that whole thing, swapping them with the friends and all the rest. And to be fair, we didn't care because it was just meant as a bit of fun, but also it was, it was creating interest in the labs and there was a little bit of hubbub about the labs and students and students were talking about it and uh, as far as i was concerned for these 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 digital stickers and rolling digital badges which are a little more formal um these digital stickers were just there just to try and do do that just to try and increase interaction and interest around the course but uh, yeah you only got them at the end when once you've once you've done your bit <laughs> Uh, and then one one more about class notebooks about uh, some problems. Uh, if you can see, if you got the chat open, I haven't. Sorry, I've... oh sorry. So we uh, we tried class notebooks on a module. We found that student notebooks are not always synchronising at the lecturer's end. So wondering if you face any similar issues or other issues. Yep. We did have some other issues, I suppose. Yes, possibly. Um, <laughs> no, no is the short answer. Um, we set them up, and like I said, so last year we had something like four hundred students concurrently accessing this one logbook. Um, the only problems we did have were probably more on our side. I think we didn't quite articulate what it was we wanted students to do in these logbooks. Um, you can provision them with a template, which we did do, but students being students, a lot went off piste and they went and did their own things. And then they didn't kind of tell us about that until the very last minute. So uh, on deadline submission day, they kind of suddenly woke up and realized that, oh, they've been saving their notes into their own private logbooks somewhere or using a different notebook system completely because they, they kind of didn't understand what it was we were asking them um, but even at that stage there was a little bit of kind of last minute oh but everyone got them submitted uh, they copied the content across if they needed to but, uh, and that was a tiny percentage i think out of 400 people i think it's about five people had had bother like that but other than that i think it, it worked quite well it's uh it's funny we were looking at them uh, yesterday so for the, the current cohort 450 of them um, and because we've got that right, we've got that messaging right this year, uh, the notebooks are filling up lovely. You know, you, you can see that uh, they're writing the notes in the labs, using the tablets, as they should be doing. Um, they're copying these digital stickers across. Um, and it, yeah, it seems to be working all right. Um, yeah, I don't think we had any problems particularly. I'm trying to think. Um, certainly at the end of the, 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 the academic year when the students submitted them they were all there and they were all pretty good um if, if you give students kind of caught blanche like we did they can go off and do all sorts of stuff and that makes marking them slightly harder because everyone you open it's slightly different um i think using the templating function is probably the best way to do that so make it a bit more rigid um, i think we've learned that this year so we have done that we've created sections for them pages within those sections um yeah that makes assessing it a lot easier Glenn, uh, yeah, there's nothing else in the chat. I don't know if it's, no. uh, oh, great. Yeah, I well, thanks, Salman. Yes, uh, that was uh, yeah. I think it did go well. Would you would you agree, Glenn? Yeah. I think it was a good project. I think it went went great. Yeah, good experience. But yeah, brilliant. Well, thank you very much for for coming this afternoon. Um, really appreciate Hi. it. Um, Hi, Terry. If you're happy me to end the recording now, I'll go ahead and do so. Please do, Christina. That's great. Thank you very much.